state to state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your sports betting needs. Baseball, golf, soccer, plus all the top fights in MMA and boxing. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head to the online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of over 150 slots games. Head to betonline.ag today to get in on the action. Use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. State of State is presented by Bet Online. The game starts here. State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fearlessness of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out their Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of State of State. I'm Tom Hannafin, joined by Justin King. It's been a newsworthy week for Penn State football, not only the announcement of the official whiteout game for Penn State in 2024, but also there's some wonderful gossip out there that I, I just couldn't resist on bringing up, especially some recent comments made by Penn State quarterback Drew Aller and former Penn State wide receiver, now Auburn Tiger, Keandre Lambert-Smith. We talked about it a little bit last week. Were some shots fired? Well, it seems like, yes, some shots are definitely being fired in the public in some passive-aggressive forms, but we're going to get to that. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, rate us, turn on notifications. Thank you so much for commenting, as always, on YouTube and on social media at State of State Pod. We appreciate it so much. Before we dive into the rumor mill here, Justin, I got to get your thoughts on the announcement of the official whiteout game for Penn State 2024, Saturday, November 9th, Penn State hosting Washington. I think it's a good matchup. Uh, I, think, I mean, I think it's a different matchup, so it brings uh, the West Coast fan base to an experience of the whiteout, which I think is the long-term goal of building the brand of Penn State in this new ecosystem i think we got to really look at this football season like this is like this is the new age of college football right so it's going to be pretty exciting to see the new matchups and the, the white out maybe at 3 p.m or whatever that case may be but the white out against the west coast or former pack pack 12 or pack 10 team there's been talk of okay if somehow in a world that Fox doesn't pick up Ohio State versus Penn State for big noon kickoff at 12 p.m. Eastern. Well, then you have the the helmet stripe game, the AKA the sneaky whiteout. So it's like, oh, everybody's like, well, what if that gets bumped to a night game or something? Or even, as you were saying, like 3.30 p.m. Eastern or something like that. And then there was uh, something on social media reported by Christian Hackenberg that said that at 3.30 p.m. on CBS is when we're going to see Penn State versus Washington. So if that actually comes to fruition, very curious. But you, you and I have talked about it, the whiteouts that occur have occurred and you've played in them, the ones that kind of start mid-afternoon and then turn into a night game. It's a different element, same vibe, same atmosphere. I think everybody gets hung up on like, it's got to be at 7 p.m., it's got to be at night. And maybe it's like, okay, this is that happy medium or something like that, or if anything, and, and you can speak to this, that second half where the lights kind of get a little bit dimmer and the crowd gets a little bit more rowdy. What do you feel? Yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like a ramp up. Right. So there's not a, a acclimation period for the offense. So like it's like the, the crowd not necessarily changes, but the vibe definitely changes when it's it's getting darker at five and six o'clock. You know what I mean? Coming out in the second half. I like I enjoyed the whiteout at three thirty. Like when we played Notre Dame, I think that was like the full one. And it was uh, it was pretty cool. Again, it's hard to compete with a night game and just coming out from the kickoff, you know, the electricity's at a hundred or you know, the, the the temperature, but I mean, I'm more excited about the matchup against Washington, to be completely honest. 
I agree with you. I'm I'm curious to see what Washington is this year. They've had so much change. I really do want to see that. And also, you hit the nail on the head, welcoming a new team to the Big Ten, experiencing that atmosphere, I think is going to be very cool. Yes, we all wish it had been Ohio State. We're going to get the sneaky white out. It'll probably be at noon Eastern, but like, you know, this is the best decision for a scenario where you just weren't going to get the optimal environment you wanted. So it could have been in Illinois. It could have been UCLA. I'm glad it's Washington. Would we have liked it to have been Ohio State? Sure, but here we are. So at least it's settled. Let's get to some of the comments that we've been talking about. So to kind of rehash from last week, uh, there was an interview that Penn State quarterback Drew Auer gave to Blue White Illustrated, and you and I talked about it. It was him expressing his confidence in Penn State's wide receivers hitting into 2024. So the exact quote was, the wide receivers, quote, they're 10 times ahead, even from where we were in the spring. And I think it's really been the three leaders in that room, Trey, Liam, and Fleming. I think they've really taken it upon themselves to change that culture. So you and I talked about this, and you even said some shots fired, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> and it was like, change that culture was an interesting turn of phrase now. Um, now let's also re remind ourselves that four wide receivers have transferred out. Malik Mega going to Coastal Carolina. Malik McLean going to Arizona State. Dante Cephas going to Kansas State. I, I, I don't mean to be mean to Dante. I just kind of flat out forgotten about him because we felt like these comments were kind of directed at Keandre Lambert-Smith, who transferred to Auburn. Um, in your opinion, before we show the clip from Keandre, did you feel those comments were pointed maybe at all four of those individuals, maybe two of those individuals, maybe just one of those individuals? I think when you look at the culture, I think you're looking at the collective. So I think it's a little bit of you know, hit dog hollers, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, Keandre was essentially the number one coming into the season. And so I think if he's setting the tone or if you're the, the guy of the room, you would take that personal. So, I mean, that's how I would have took it if I would have left. <laughs> So, so it's uh, it's interesting in that this interview that we're about to show with Penn State's former wide receiver, Keandre Lambert-Smith, now part of the Auburn Tigers roster, comes from within the Believe Podcast Network, as a matter of fact, on the Everything Auburn podcast with Taylor Davis and former NFL and Auburn quarterback Jason Campbell. He was asked about his relationship with now Auburn quarterback Peyton Thorne, who a lot of Penn State fans and Big Ten fans probably remember transferred to Auburn last year from Michigan State. And uh, not exactly a remarkable 2023, but it seems like Auburn is loaded up and there could be some weapons for him to play with, that sort of thing. But Keandre Lambert-Smith was asked about how things are going with quarterback Peyton Thorne, and this was his answer. Just being around him, you know, hearing how he controls the team at the end of a workout and hearing the, the, the leadership, I feel like that gives the off uh, the offense that that sense of confidence right there. Yeah, and that kind of was lacking where I came from, and so I know I know just the difference and how that can make the offense feel because I felt different when I heard him talking. Totally. I'm just, yeah, like and then like just how he hits me up, Joe. Let's go work out. Let's go get these routes. Uh, let's hit the field. You know, and me, Vado. You got Da out there. You got a few other receivers, Rob. Like how we just getting extra work and. Yeah. So I just feel like I feel like everybody is just practicing with the intent of like this narrative is going to change. And I yeah. feel like this, like I said, I haven't been here, but I can I hear the same stuff that, you know, you guys hear. Sure. So I just feel like everybody got a chip on their shoulder to really change the narrative. And like I said, we got the guys to do it, not only in the receiver room, but at tight end, at running back, at quarterback. I feel like we got quarterbacks after Peyton who can right. come in and step up and, and throw, you know, real good deep balls, quick, anything. So, I mean, I feel like the, the offense is – I think I just told somebody – I forgot who I told. I think it was DA. I'm like, bro, I haven't been a part of an offense where I felt like like we got it, like, wow. in every position. So, I, I mean, okay. like I said, I'm ready for the season. I'm ready for camp. Yeah, ready. No. <laughs> we all are. Okay. So, Justin, thoughts? Well, I was going into it. I was like, well, maybe like the first 30 seconds, but maybe he's just – talking about his new teammates trying to get into it because I had an old story where I left I left the Rams after four years and I we were with Sam Bradford and then I went to the Colts and we had drafted Andrew Luck and I remember getting a question you know about the two and I just remember talking good stuff about Andrew Luck not even thinking about Sam Bradford but I ended up saying something that was like sounded like a shot right <laughs> like 
it was just the truth. I was trying to give him that at the beginning, but as it kept going, it, it's hard to dispute that he was, he heard the, the, the Drew Aller uh, quote. And I mean, kind of going into the team there and then leaning into, I guess, the differences that he might have seen or we might have heard from fans, whether it's like Drew's demeanor or him being laid back and like the leadership that he's experiencing down here, even from the standpoint I thought was interesting was the uh, quarterback calling him to work out. I thought that was a, I thought that was a interesting one because you would think that that was common occurrence at Penn state, but he's kind of hinting that it wasn't right. So man, Hey, that's what happens in competitive sports, right? Like you say something, somebody says something back. So we gotta just see what happens in the fall. But I mean, the offense didn't click and was kind of choppy last year. And so if this was kind of underlying tension within the receiver and quarterback room, which just how people operated. I think I'm starting to see a little bit of it come to the, come to the light. I think there's a couple layers to it altogether. Is that I know Penn State fans are hard on Drew Aller and the expectations have been high, five-star recruit, all these things. Like everybody expected him to be the second coming, right? And especially after Sean Clifford, such a polarizing quarterback for Penn State fans. Some people loved him, some people hated him, and people wanted to see better production from the quarterback position. I think that's understood. So there's part of me that looks at what Drew did in 2023, and we always talk about the touchdown to interception ratio, and it's like, wow, it was really positive, 27 to 2. Like, it, you can't get much better than that, honestly. But people were like, well, where's the the explosive play uh, capability, uh, the, the issues for him under pressure, his completion percentage really, really dropped considerably whenever he was under pressure. So part of it is it's a first-year starting quarterback. As a sophomore, it's his first opportunity to be the guy. So is it that expectation that automatically in 2023, Drew should have stepped in and been Mr. Big, loud, outspoken, super confident, this is my team, everybody get behind me, I got us, that sort of thing? Or is Drew just a laid-back, stoic type of guy, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low in the words of James Franklin, And he leads by example. And maybe he learned some things in 2023 that Keandre might have seen and was like, hey, I need a little bit more from the guy. And just Drew wasn't at that point of progression. And maybe now he is. I mean, all those things are fair, right? Like, I think that's you can be you can be laid back and still be a a solid leader and all those different type of things. Um, I guess, again, by the numbers, he had a pretty good season. But uh, like passing the eye test of where the ceiling is, I think people place, you know, that belief or that social or emotional equity into what they feel when they watch them play, watch somebody play. And it's like, it seems that they're rattled. Do you really trust it? Because I think that's what you feel from the fans. Like, do we trust that this is going to get us to that pinnacle when we've had different quarterbacks that we might have trusted even more? So it mix that in with the expectations at the beginning. So, I mean... New, new, new coach, new, new personnel, and across the board. So, time will tell. It's, it's going to be interesting. I think there's a lot of elements with Drew that are interesting, and you have talked about it. That emotional equity, that emotional investment that fans have in quarterbacks, and it's so interesting because we've had Mike Porman from StateCollege.com here on the podcast, and he's talked about a lot of people see. Bo Perbula's personality and he seems like a natural leader Mm -hmm. and Drew has been just a little bit more laid back and there have been people that have said we'd like him to be a little bit louder a little bit more outspoken really uh really galvanize people and I was curious to get your opinion on this is that there are so few players and quarterbacks specifically who are natural born leaders they just show up they have that dna they have that personality and it just it happens and then there's got to be a fair amount of leaders that i'm sure you experience where whether it's a coach or a player an element of it is learned and performative not to say that they're lying or manipulating people or anything like that but you have to understand the psychology of being that leader and then if i do this this guy's going to react this way and vice versa. And that's either a positive or a negative. And that just comes with time. What's your experience been on that front? I mean, even laid back leaders, they give off 
I mean, a level of seriousness, right? Like, it's not like a calm, like, oh, he's a nice guy. Like, most laid back leaders that I had in the past or I played with, they had a disposition that was kind of like unsettling to an extent. Like, if they were laid back, it's like, oh, I don't know exactly what he's going to do. And so from that leader standpoint, and then they kind of led by example. But it was always from a standpoint of like, yeah, that's not a tree you want to bark up. You know what I'm saying? Like, th- th- that was kind of what it was. They weren't like just the most, they weren't laid back and the most personable guy and just, hey, he's super nice. And you just approach him. Like, no, the laid back leaders are like that. So the more charismatic leaders that are out there and like you said, like kind of value that personal interaction, like we have to galvanize the crew, like, and they do that understanding. But the real ones are they're like real leaders. Like they kind of lead that way and they kind of had the audacity to put that leader cap on and wear that title. And I think we all have preconceived notions of what we expect to be a leader. Like most people are followers. So it's like if the guy's loud. A lot of people, it's the herd mentality, especially in football. Because it's about the team. It's like you understand like, oh, this person is going to be a leader or it's the upperclassman that's going to be a leader. And a lot of times, I mean, you just see whether it's in corporate America other times, like you, you see leadership traits from younger people, right? Like all the time. So like if someone identifies leadership traits in other, like just an, an individual, like I remember I got drafted. I mean, I love the, I mean, he was a great dude, Scott Linehan, but like he was, he was a great officer coach and all those good things. But when you talked about like, okay, it's a leader, like just the way he operated, like it didn't command a group of men in the NFL. And then three weeks later, he gets fired. So like, and I re- I recognize that coming from playing from Joe to him. I'm like, man, this dude ain't. So Joe, like, again, he was, he was laid back. He wasn't a raw, raw guy, but like, you knew exactly what it was. Like, he didn't have to say right. much. <laughs> like, he said a couple words and like, it was what it was. He very clear on the expectations. And that was, a, so that's like typical the leader that I've followed in the past. So. The raw, raw guys, yeah, I'm more so looking for the red flags in them, but the real ones, it's kind of a slow and steady, you know, being passed. So, like, it's not to be laid back is a bad thing. It's just, I think it's his cheeriness. Like, he doesn't really have a, a negative disposition. I don't want to say a negative disposition, but like a, you know. Like, he seems he's, like a nice, a nice guy. You know yeah, I mean? like, he that's, seems like a nice kid. Like he, he shows emotion on the field. That's the one thing. It's like, good to be a nice guy, too. Let me clear that up. Like, it's not yeah, bad to be. Nothing wrong with nice, that. Nothing wrong with it. But if you want to win a championship, sometimes we talk about that social equity. And when people feel comfortable mm. and, like, I'm getting behind this guy, it's like I'm getting behind this guy because of this. Like, that's why certain demographic or certain personality types love Kobe Bryant and love Jordan. And when you know, look at it, it's more personality types that like LeBron because they more identify not with the stats or whatever the case may be, but like that personality type of like what it is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's and, interesting. And Drew is emotional in his own way and that you see sure. him on the field when things have gone badly, you can see he's ticked off about it. And you can see when like maybe something gets miscommunicated or a guy messes up a route or something like that. He's not driving the guy into the ground, but he's going to let him know in a respectful way. I think that's one thing I've noticed about him. And I see him be excited and exuberant about a lot of different things on the field. There's a great picture of him and Keandre, ironically, from the West Virginia game last year after scoring that huge 70 plus yard touchdown. And he was freaking fired up. So part of me sitting here and I'm like, is it just being too hard on a third year quarterback? Is it a former wide receiver that didn't get the number one attention at Penn State that is maybe a little bit salty and some might have reported was maybe a little selfish? And on top of that, a little bit of a comparison that's unfair that Keandre kind of alluding that Peyton Thorne is better than Drew as an overall quarterback. Or is this just the fact that Peyton Thorne, I think, has been playing quarterback at the college level for five six years and drew's entering his third so it's like it's almost apples to oranges it's it's hard to dissect it definitely is apples to oranges especially when you look at it from that standpoint of like drew was just a younger guy so like him getting around you know and an older person i mean that's it and it, and it kind of he's kind of telling on himself to an extent too because if he's waiting for a younger guy to take the lead and he wasn't like the older receiver it's like instead of like, were you not? Why aren't you going with Drew to go get throws in with him? Right. If you're the number one guy, you know, he's like, so I think, yeah, he kind of told on himself, but I mean, it's, um, things are coming to light. 
it's i think it's just so funny and it's all very passive aggressive in the media and there's sure. the possibility that even drew's initial comments that the culture in the room has changed he might not even have necessarily meant that uh -huh. directed at keandre lambert smith maybe he did a little bit but at the same time <laughs> like i just talked about the turnover in that wide receiver room was significant this past cycle so yes it's, it does feel like a virtually different room almost all together there's still some familiar faces sure but that top part of the depth chart has certainly changed i think this is a number of factors I, it's very difficult for me to sit here and say that peyton thorne has more athletic capability than drew aller altogether again apples to oranges peyton thorne is more uh mobile than drew can do that but drew obviously has a cannon for an arm has all the arm talent in the world that you like to talk about very very smart with the football as was evidenced in 2023 and it's just a matter of this progression and everybody's talking about drew could be the number one overall pick in 2025 or at least top five or top 10 the nfl seems to like his game that's all well and good. It's just got to play out on the field in 24. But it's this mudslinging that you see, especially, Justin, when it comes to the transfer portal. And I get I get bent out of shape. as like where I was. Keandre saying where I was. It's like, are you that hurt? You can't even say the name of the school that you spent, what was it, four years all together at and, and gave you the opportunity ultimately to transfer to a place the caliber of Auburn because of the opportunities you got at Beaver Stadium and in a Penn State uniform? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they're going to like be that grateful of it. I mean, it's the business, right? He's providing a service. They're providing a service. <laughs> and it's time to go. But all these guys are a little bit more, uh, uh, I don't say emotional, but a little bit more sensitive. They get a little bit more heat from social media and things coming in, so they're a lot more defensive when you say anything to them, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm just, and I'm noticing that just me recently in the past year dealing closer with athletes. Sure. It's like, oh, oh, that hurts your feelings, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Has you you hit on an interesting word there, uh, grateful, and it's just that concept of gratitude. Has gratitude kind of gone out the window with NIL and the transfer portal, where it's like, what um, what you've done for me, what you've done for me doesn't mean much. It's what's ahead of. I think that's a pretty deep concept because I think that more so comes from like the honest answer like comes from your home and your values of why you're playing the game. So like the gratitude of what you're doing, I think there's a lot of guys, regardless of NIL, that are like thankful for the opportunity kind of to what you said to play in front of a big stage or live out their dreams or take full advantage of the opportunity. So I don't think NIL negates guys from being grateful, but then you get some guys that develop their identity through rankings and stars and going on seven on seven trips and being valued that way and the next thing you know they're not really grateful for the game or what the game can provide because it's not a shower of the ego and then when things go wrong it's do 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 yeah i mean so i think it's more of the foundation of the person than it is in io i'm so curious to see how 2024 goes now for obviously drew Auer, but also keandre lambert smith because hindsight's 2020, is he going to go play for Auburn this year? Is he going to be the number one guy? How's Peyton Thorne going to perform? Is he going to live up to Keandre's expectations? Do those guys stay healthy so that they can cash in on the opportunity that's ahead of them in Auburn? They've recruited well. They've done very well in the transfer portal, throwing around a lot of money. And then the flip side for Drew. Say Drew under Andy Kolnicki in this new offense we're going to be looking at. Say this is a feast for Julian Fleming, Trey Wallace, Liam Clifford, Omari Evans, Caden Saunders, you name it. And Keandre sitting down in Alabama being like, I made the wrong decision. Hey, that's what they, that comes with the territory. And they say, what did the guy say? Bet on yourself, right? <laughs> I, I love this, but there is part of me and I don't know how you feel, but it's like, hey, it's like, you say this stuff, that's all well and good. But after a while, it's like, shut up and go play. Go prove it, right? Time will come. Let us know what you guys think in the comments section because it's it's nice to have just a little bit of gossip and mudslinging. I love to talk X's and O's, of course, but this is just something in July that it's like, yeah, we might as well chat about this a little bit with training camp right around the corner. Like, comment, subscribe, rate us, turn on notifications, get in the comment section, as I said, on YouTube. And 
on social media at State of State Pod. You guys are never shy in that respect, and we really, really appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, we're going to see if anybody else pops off on social media. Justin, do you have anything you want to throw out there? <laughs> That's a passive-aggressive shot at anybody right now. <laughs> no, no passive-aggressive shots. Maybe some stuff to recruits, man. Key tra- the key thing when going through this process are so many different opportunities, opportunities that perform, cams, go to this cam, go to this exposure cam. The key to this whole business is like building out your competitive endurance. So any chance you get to compete, regardless of what, even if you lose different reps, you're not even being judged on how well you execute techniques right now. You're being judged on your traits and your level of competitiveness. So when you have opportunities to compete, it is to your benefit to compete. Every chance you get. That is the prerequisite to get to the highest level to where you can monetize all this time that you're putting in. So don't fall for all the stars and all the different exposures. But at the end of the day, when you want to develop, that means you want to compete. So lock that in. Justin King knows ball. He's Jay King. I'm Tom Hannafin. Thank you for joining us on State of State. Thank you all so much for joining us. This episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, let us know what you think of the show on social media and check out all of our content on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Search for the handle at State of State Pod. State of State is presented by Bet Online and by Blue White Outfitters.